All right, uh, good evening all. My name is Neil Creek. I'm a member of NBO and an astrophotographer. I gave a talk a few weeks ago uh, titled Easy Astrophotography, in which I introduced the uh, concepts and challenges of uh, night sky astrophotography with a camera and tripod uh, using wide angle lenses, not tracking, just using whatever gear you've already got with you if you've got a bit of uh, photography gear. Um, tonight I'm going to go uh, the next step and talk about post-processing your photos. Um, all photos really, I believe, benefit from a bit of post-processing. Uh, that's the sort of thing that used to be done in the dark room or in the photo lab, so even before digital photos were processed. Um, so it's not that now things are digital, we don't have to worry about it, just take a photo and it's there. Every, bit of, every photo can benefit from a bit of post-processing, but astrophotography in particular. Um, the main reason being is that most cameras are tuned for daylight photography, and so the, the settings that they will apply to the previews that they generate generally aren't going to be the best that they could be for an astro photo. You want to be able to tweak that yourself. And that can be a little bit intimidating, so I'm going to try and give a brief introduction to how I do that um, using the software that I use, and I'll go into that shortly, um, and demonstrate on some actual examples my process and how I do that so that you can see just how easy it is and what sort of results you can get. Um, first of all, my advice to anyone shooting anything is to shoot in RAW. The main reason for that is RAW is a format that captures all the information, all the data that the camera has available to it. If you're shooting in JPEG, it's taking the RAW and it's making a preview out of that. And as I said, it makes a preview based on its own algorithms, what it thinks looks best. And in astrophotography, that's really the case. It's really the, it's the best for the photo. So for post-processing, I use um, a combination of Lightroom and Photoshop, both by Adobe. Um, I mentioned last time that they are available primarily as a subscription service. Uh, if you don't like um, subscription services and you want to own the software, you can, can buy them separately, but together they cost a couple of thousand dollars or more. The subscription service, I believe, is uh, $15 Australian per month. So uh, this is uh, probably the leading software that most photographers and professional photographers <coughs> use, so I'm going to be using that for my demonstrations. However, the basic concepts and principles that are involved in post-processing photos should apply to all digital processing <coughs> software. Um, I also like to briefly talk about um, a workflow. Um, when you're doing any kind of photography, you want to be able to understand uh, or to keep track of all your photos and have them in a logical structure. It can be especially important for astrophotography when you're starting to get into some of the more advanced techniques like taking multiple photos, stacking them together, and even more so when you're getting into telescopic astrophotography where you're taking calibration frames, multiple, multiple exposures with different filters and so forth. So it's a good idea to come up with or have a think about and come up with a naming and filing system that works well for you. Um, my own system, I use a combination of um, different file names. The, um, the file name encodes the information about the photo. It has my surname, it has the date and it has the number of the photo in the order that they were taken. And the directory <coughs> structure mirrors that but without the, the file number and it adds into it a few keywords. So for example, I might have um, 17.06.19 as the date, so 2017, June 19th. In that order, it means that you can order things in the file list and they'll appear in the correct chronological order. Uh, then the, um, the brief description of what it's shooting, so it might have been Milky Way at, um, uh, that was uh, in Dalesford, so I might put that in the description. So when I'm scrolling through and I get to the close date, I can just read the, the description in the file and the folder name and it will be right there. Um, so that's my way of doing things. Uh, your way might be different. I encourage you to have a think about it. Um, the sooner the better, because the more photos you take without having any sort of organisation or structure, the more difficult it will be to retrieve those photos in the future and work with them. Uh, it also helps to have a structure that you can then mirror between your raw files and your exported files. You're not going to export everything because you're not going to process every photo that you take. You'll choose the best ones. But if you have a mirrored structure so that you can then look at an exported photo that you've edited and you say, okay, I remember that photo, I want to get a print of it, so I'll go back to the raw photo and I'll do an export at the maximum possible quality, as opposed to you might have exported at lower resolution for uploading to Facebook or online services. Okay. Um, before I get into the demonstration, have you got any questions for me um, so far uh, about the workflow and introduction? Yes, Heike. I, I'm nowhere near at any of these levels, but um, how do you know 
to make your camera take a raw photo because I've got a really basic camera. Can it do that or will it just automatically do what it wants? Most cameras today yes. um, that are sort of beyond the bottom level will have the ability to take raw. Uh, even some smartphones can do that now. Okay. So you will need to look up your camera manual and choose uh, or determine where the choice is to make that uh, setting. Usually it's under the file settings where you, you choose the JPEG resolution and detail. So if you see um, RAW plus JPEG or RAW or JPEG super fine, JPEG large, JPEG small, all that sort of stuff, yep. it's amongst those. Okay, thank you. Thank no you. problem. Anyone else? Yes. Um, Neil, are you going to be covering purely DSLRs or is that going to be DSLRs and some astro cameras and things like that? Um, th this will be all DSLR photos, but they'll be representative of the sort of things you can get of the sort of uh, equipment I discussed in the last lecture, where I was talking about what sort of gear you can use to take um, astro photos with. As in when you're talking about making sure the settings are set to and so on, that all applies to DSLRs. Yes, it applies to um, other kind of like mirrorless cameras and high-end um, compact and bridge cameras as well. Uh, it's a sort of the same thing. Uh, we're not going to be talking about astrophotography specific cameras like you might look up to your telescope uh, in this, in this um, lesson, um, but I'll talk more about telescopic astrophotography in the next lecture, in some time in the future. Anything else? Okay, let's start the demonstration. So I've hooked up the laptop here to connect to um, the screen via Wi-Fi, so there might be a little bit of uh, latency, but we'll uh, work through it if necessary uh, to our, the best we can. So I'm using Lightroom here, and I've got a few photos uh, that are all unprocessed that I'm going to use as a demonstration. I'm going to start with that one that was shown as a preview first. So in Lightroom here, we're in what's called the library module, and that is a part of the software that you use to um, maintain and organize all your files. Uh, let's assume that all these photos were taken on the same day and so they're all in the same folder and we're going to, we've already gone through and selected the best ones and we're going to process those. So I'm going to show you the processing steps that I take. Um, we go into the develop module. Processing uh, is a, a difficult word sometimes because I may end up tripping over my tongue and saying and going through the processing process because it's one of those words that's both a verb and an adjective. So, all right. Let's uh, have a look at this one. I usually go through a number of steps at the start of processing every photo to try and neutralize things, to try and get a good base that I can uh, then go on and do creative things with. So in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, most photos, I will start with lens corrections. And these are built into Lightroom and use a huge collection of um, database, a huge database that Adobe have created by taking lots and lots of camera bodies and lots of lots of lenses and taking photographs of test targets with combinations of each and from that they then determine the camera's faults and flaws like um, distortion and vignetting and so forth and come up with profiles to automatically correct those for each combination of camera and lens. So it's just a one click. So this one here I'm removing chromatic aberration which is a, uh, a problem with color fringing at the corners of the frame. And this one is uh, removing both distortion and vignetting. Braden, you've got a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the specification of this photograph? Actually, I should discuss that before I process each of them for you. So this was taken with a uh, Canon 5D Mark III uh, using the Canon 50mm f1.8 lens at f1.8. It was a 10 second exposure at ISO 3200. The reason why it's a 10 second exposure is so that I can minimize the trails that you would get, otherwise at 50 millimeters you would see some significant trailing at 30 seconds. Um, that explains why the uh, aperture is at its widest open, um, but we have a, a compromise in the, the, um, the issue that at the corners of the frame you will see that the stars are quite um, distorted. They don't look like stars, they look like sort of blurs or smudges, um, especially the brighter ones. So what happens if we look at our photos, the photograph? Over here, yep. It looks like it's trailed, but that's not trailing. That's the smearing from the coma effect. Um, and it's also taking a few moments to generate the full resolution preview from the raw file, as you can see it's just done there, um, because this is uh, an older laptop so it's a bit slow. So we may see a little bit of delays as I'm processing here. I've got a faster computer at home for my processing on my desktop. Yes? 
Yes, it was. Yep, using a self timer to uh, trigger the shutter without touching the camera. Um, so as you can see, there's not really that much in the way of trailing, but there is um, issues in the corners with the, um, the the distortion from the the lens being wide open. Yep. Is it actual viable to try and move the mountain track no, definitely not. Even um, a breeze can cause it to shake enough that there will be an artifact. So um, trying to move it by hand is just completely out of the question. Uh, if you want to track at all, you'll need a tracking mount. Uh, but there are some cheaper, uh, cheapish options that will uh, do that for you quite adequately. All right, so I've now flattened that image, um, both with the distortion and with the vignetting. I'm now going to do some um, colour correction, some basic colour balancing. Now, the night sky is a tricky thing to colour balance because it's not exactly the sort of colours that the camera is used to and the colours are very low level because it's very dim. So one trick I like to use is to turn the vibrance and saturation sliders all the way up to the maximum. As you can see, I'm working over here on the right panel. Um, those sliders I've put up to 100 and you can see the image now looks quite hideous. However, it allows me to see the general overall tint of the image. Now, as it is, it's looking perhaps a little bit yellow and a little bit pink. So I'm going to change the temperature slider to correct the yellow and make it slightly more blue, but that's gone too far. You can also look at the histogram up here, which splits out the colors. And I want to try and get the blue on top of the yellow to try and get it as neutral as possible. Either way. It's hard to move at really small amounts, so you can always type in by clicking on this and just typing in a number. But that looks about right for the blue and red being on top of each other. Now I need, sorry, the blue and yellow. Now I need to correct for the tint, and we've got a red peak over here and a green peak under there, so that means we need to t take out a bit of pink and put in a bit of green. And that's looking a bit better, but that's now shifted the blue down again. So we just do back and forth a little bit until we get them as neutral as possible. Now we may change this later, but we'll do that as a creative choice rather than that's just the way it came out of the camera. Oh, it's so touchy. There we go. That can work as well. Yes, I'll demonstrate that. So you click on the, the number box, and then as I'm t touching my keypad, I'm moving it up and down by Oh, I think it's 100 or so, or 50. And that's uh, allowing it to have a bit more fine control without having to drag it. So that looks like I've got it fairly neutral now. So I am going to double click on the words, vibrance and saturation, that resets their values. So you can see now I've got a fairly good flat starting point. Uh, one last thing I'm going to do is look at the detail and the noise correction. So turn off sharpening always, because all you're doing there is sharpening the noise. Bring up your luminance slider, which affects the luminance variation, the luminance noise, and then bring up the color slider which affects the chrominance noise, that is noise in the color pixels as opposed to the brightness values. If I zoom in and close and have a look, just wait for it to generate the preview. Okay, I can turn the effect on and off with this little button. So this was before noise filtering, and this is after. So it's a subtle but significant difference. Uh, that difference will become more apparent as we process as well because processing the image can cause it to um, bring up the noise. So, okay, that's our image with basic corrections. Now we move on to the artistic side of things, making it look like you want it to look for a bit more punch and impact. And this is where it gets very subjective, where the photographer's personal creative style uh, influences the result. Um, Many astrophotographers might be happy to leave it as this because they really like to have a very natural, um, sort of unaffected look at the way the stars appear, uh, capturing them sort of as they are. However, I like to um, more make it look like how it feels, so more of an impression of the, the beauty of the night sky. I also like to bring out things that we can't necessarily see, the contrast and the colours, to, to make it look more impressive. Yes, Braden. Yes. Are they impossible to remove? Or? They are very difficult to remove. Yeah. Um, they're as a result of um, essentially chromatic aberration, which is the result of the lenses not being able to bring all of the colors into perfect focus. Yeah. 
it shows up particularly on bright stars and it usually shows up in the blue frequencies more so than any other color but you can see there's sort of a, a pink around this one here yeah um i will address that a little bit later there are some things you can do but unfortunately unless you're using a mirror telescope you're not going to be able to avoid that completely but then mirror telescopes have other issues to deal with that are different um you can get um certain telescope optics that are designed to com combat these rings but they are very expensive telescopes and that's where you sort of you pay a lot of money for a very little bit of improvement but i mean you can see these are quite obvious and quite distracting so some for um, astrophotographers are more than willing to spend that money to get that extra bit of quality yeah. it does yes yeah. certainly what you'd be uploading to a, a social media um, site to share you wouldn't see that all right, so I like to start next with setting the black and the white points. That is the brightest pixels and the darkest pixels. So my white slider here, I'm bringing it up and down. You may not be able to see much effect, but if I hold the Alt key while dragging it, it gives me a preview of where it's clipping. That is where the details are being pushed out of the range of the photo's ability to show them. So at this point at plus 67, all of those stars are clipped. That means they've got white cores with no color and detail. So I'm going to bring it down until only the very brightest stars are clipped because they were clipped in capture. That means that the original photograph captured more pixels or more photons in those pixels than could be rendered um, in detail. So the pixel cells in, on the sensor were overflowing with photons. We don't want to push that any worse than it was, so we just bring it down to about that point. Um, the blacks, we do the same, but in the other direction. So I hold the Alt key and you can see there's nothing clipped there. If I bring the blacks down, you can see the trees start to go out. That doesn't matter too much because the trees aren't really the important thing in our shot. And foreground elements are almost always darker than the sky, unless of course you've got lighting on them. So I'm gonna keep bringing it down until I start to see parts of the sky clipping. All right, up there, up the top, you can see the clipping indicator right up there. So I'm gonna bring it back from there until they all disappear and then let go of the alt key. So now that's looking a lot more contrasty already. And all we've done is change the black and white points. That is a starting point though. I want to push it further. And in doing so, a lot of this is going to be a bit of backwards and forwards. You make one change, then you have to go back and update the previous change. And it's iterative. You, you go back and forth, back and forth until you're happy with how it looks. So I usually like to bring up the contrast, which has brought the blacks a bit too dark. So I'll bring them back up again. Yep, that's all right. Um, I think that's a little bit too black, so I'm going to bring the shadows up, which is affecting not the blackest pixels, but dark pixels. So we're starting to get a bit more detail at the top there. I think, though, we've also got a gradient across the entire image, dark at the top to light at the bottom. And that's partly to do with atmospheric glow and also light pollution. Um, so I'm going to try and correct for that a little bit by using this graduated filter over here. A graduated filter is like those old graduated neutral density filters that you, you would use as a photographer, and I still do, um, but you have full control over them. So you can change anything, the exposure, color, contrast, anything with the graduated filter. So I'm just gonna draw that right over the whole picture, the starting point to the ending point by dragging it down. You can see I've tilted that a little bit, so I just put the uh, cursor on the middle line and straighten that up. At the moment, it's nothing. I've just dragged it over. But what I'm going to do is increase the exposure. And the effect is strongest where you started and weakest where you stopped. So it's most strong at the top. So you can see there now I've brightened that up quite a bit. If I turn that off, you can see the effect there. Now that's made it overall a bit too bright and losing its contrast. So I'm going to bring, bring the contrast slider up a bit more. All right, looks like this might need a bit of extra work. There's a new filter in, um, or a new effect in latest versions of Lightroom called Dehaze, and it analyzes the whole picture, looks for areas of low contrast, and it tries to increase the local contrast in areas that have poor contrast only. Um, that's designed specifically for things like photographs underwater or through a foggy day or um, long distance tele telephoto photos of landscapes, for example. You can bring out a lot of detail by getting rid of the haze. Well, we've got a bit of haze here from light pollution and air glow. So I'm gonna slide up the dehaze slider. And you can see that's doing quite a good job of improving the contrast. 
But I've got to be careful here because the dehaze filter does have the effect of clipping the blacks, of making the blacks go extra dark. And um, that may be what's happening here. So I'm just going to check the blacks again. So that looks all right, actually. There's no clipping. But I will bring up the shadows a bit. All right. I'm relatively happy with the contrast there. Maybe a little bit more. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now I'm going to work on the saturation. We've already got the color balance neutral. I like how that's looking. The Milky Way's got sort of yellow around here as it should, and this is a sort of more greenish blue out here. So I'm going to increase the vibrance and see how that looks. I like that. Now the problem with increasing vibrance is that it also has the effect of decreasing the exposure. There's an inverse relationship between saturation and exposure. As you saturate things more, the exposure drops a little bit and vice versa. So I'm going to bring up the overall exposure a little bit. All right, that's looking pretty good. Now, doing all this, I'm, I'm revealing a few problems. Um, you may remember that the top was darker and it was also vignetted. That means the corners in particular were quite dark. Well, they're now starting to go a bit pink, and especially down the bottom here where it was black. Pink is often what appears when you... Oh, it's not really showing up on the screen there, is it? Okay. I can see it on my screen here. There's pink corners. If I zoom in, it might be a bit more apparent. Okay, it's very barely showing there, but if I show you my screen, I can turn this around, you might be able to see that pink a bit more obvious there. Um, that often happens with DSLRs when you take very, very low signal regions and increase their brightness significantly. It brings up the red pixels more than the others. So often what I do to compensate for that is simply the reverse of what I did to correct it. I increase the um, vignetting. But I do that as an effect slider rather than just going back to the corrections and undoing them because this way I've got control over it. So I am going to put some negative um, highlight priority on the, um, uh, the corners and I'm going to push the midpoint of that right out to the edge. So you can see, or hopefully you can see there, it's affecting a lot further in. As I drag this out, it's affecting further out. I only want it to affect right at the corners. So I can turn that down a bit more and you can see there now it's really only affecting the corners which I think looks okay and it sort of helps hide that pink. Now I'm going to go in and just check the noise levels, make sure my noise sliders were all good. Give it a moment to load the 100% view. This is something that really benefits from a modern powerful computer because there's a lot of uh, pixels being worked on at the same time here. Now that, there is a fair bit of noise in there but it's not too bad, especially when you go wide. Uh, you view the whole image I mean. Let's just turn it off and see what the noise correction looks like without. There we go, yeah. That's very bad now because we've brought up the exposures and that's brought out the noise. So I think if I was to push that much further, it would start losing the actual details. I might bring up the limits slider just a little bit more and the contrast slider, which helps compensate for a little bit of the softness that comes about from doing noise reduction. Now while we're here, I'm going to do what um, Braden was pointing out before and see if I can address any of the fringing on some of the brighter stars. If the computer decides to cooperate with me. Okay. Let's uh, just pan across. Uh, try again. Alright, that's in the right spot now. Okay, so we'll go into the Lens Corrections uh, tab. We've already done the profile corrections, but what we're now going to do is some manual corrections, and that's going to be in the defringing here. So we've got blue and purple around these stars, so I'm going to adjust the top slider here, and I'm going to increase the fringe defringing to about four pixels. What this does is it draws a border around contrasts that Lightroom believes has a um, color fringe, of the diameter of the uh, pixel slider that you put in there. So it will draw a, and desaturate that. It draws that border and desaturates that. So it's desaturating a four pixel ring around that star. And as you can see here, this was a star that had a pink fringe and that's gone. The blue fringes are still a bit here. That's because the hue um, range here is 
selecting the purple areas, but it's not selecting the blue. So I need to broaden this a bit to catch more of the blues in that. And it's doing a bit better, but still not quite enough. I might have to increase that different range a little bit more. There we go. That's a bit better. It's still not perfect, but it's better. There is a problem with doing this though, and I'm seeing this already. If I zoom into it three times, which again is not something you're ever going to see unless you're up there with a print and a magnifying glass, you can see these stars all have desaturated blocks around them. That's because Lightroom found a bit of fringing on all of those and it's applied the defringe to every one of them. So I'm going to dial that back again. Let's say to three pixels, see if that helps things a little. I'm going to have to also drag that slider back up because I think it's picking up the blue in the background here. All right, that's still not ideal, but it's better. But I think it's really helped with the, um, the fringing on the brightest stars. So we'll go back to one to one and we'll have a look at these stars that we were looking at before. This is still generating the preview and the previews, the low resolution preview you see before those edits. So the pink fringing here is gone. We've still got some blue fringing. So unfortunately we can't do much about that unless we go in and edit it manually. Uh, I'm not going to do that. If I was going to put this into a competition or something like that or make a large print, then I probably would. But uh, for the sake of posting to social media, this is fine. Um, and finally, because we've got these problem corners, I've addressed it a little bit with the um, vignetting, but I'm going to actually do a little bit of a crop just to get rid of the absolute worst parts of it, which are at the very outside edges. So we click on the crop control here. It removes any vignetting we've done while we're doing the cropping so that you can see it more clearly. And I'm just going to drag the top down. Oh, I'm going to also lock the aspect ratio so it stays the same um, four by six aspect ratio and hit the enter key and that's our new crop. So you can see the vignette is going back on there. So I think that looks pretty good for our first edit. Uh, let's have a quick look at what it looks like before editing. I think this will work or it might show, might show it edited because when I copied these over from my computer they were edited and then I removed those edits so it might go back to my original edit so you can see um, my first treatment versus this treatment. Yeah, okay, so I've treated this slightly differently and that's something that you'll discover as you do lots of photos every time you do them. They come out slightly different. It depends on your mood, on the lighting in the room, all sorts of things. Um, it will affect how it's, um, how you end up doing the processing. So if you want to be consistent with the processing, that can be a bit of a trick. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset all settings. So that's the before. And now if I undo the reset, so it puts them back on again. Oh, I guess the most recent at the top. This is after editing. Grant decides to load. There we go. <coughs> okay, so that's our first example. Next one I'm going to move on to is one I just took up at Byron Bay recently. And this one is a bit different in that the foreground element, which is the trees, they were lit. And I want to keep that as part of the shot. I don't want to have the trees go to black. I want to keep them as an element. Um, sometimes you might do this if you're doing, um, say, a young moon night sky photos where the moon is illuminating a foreground element or a, a mid-ground element like a field or a tree or even a mountain range. That can look really nice when you have ground uh, objects in the same composition as the sky. So I've got two different lighting here to deal with because the sky is light pollution a bit but the ground is lit by very specific lights, so I'm going to have to deal with them separately. So let's go through our basic um, corrections first. So lens corrections, remove chromatic aberration. This one's a bit tricky though. I shot this with a fisheye lens. Fisheyes are known for having distortions, and if you've got straight lines in them, they'll turn them into curved lines. We don't have straight lines in this, so it doesn't matter so much. But if I check profile corrections, it automatically corrects that and it ends up making it look more distorted. <laughs> so what I need to do is dial in a balance between the two of what I think looks best. So I'm going to turn down the distortion. You'll also notice that I'm getting more of my field of view back. So I reckon I'm going to do it enough just to get rid of the tree that was poking in up here. Now, the next thing that's... Oh, yes, right? So, so that's all right. Is it actually possible to do it in reverse and sort of accentuate 
distortion You can. Uh, with the distortion slider here, instead of going left, you can go right. So it doesn't make it more round, I suppose, but it does push it in. Whereas what we're doing with the distortion correction is we're pushing it out. All right, so the next thing I see, <coughs> let me just tweak that. <coughs> Pardon me. Still going to get over a little bit of a bronchitis, I'm afraid. All right, the next thing I see is that the trees are a bit slanted. I think it would look nicer if the line across the top of the trees sort of, uh, no, okay, the front one, yeah, the battery must be down, okay. The line across the top of the trees from here over to here, I'd prefer that to be level or roughly level. So I'm going to straighten that now. Click on the crop, crop tool and we're going to use this straighten tool. So you click on that once to pick it up and then you bring it over and drag it across and it draws a line and you make that level or parallel to whatever you want to be the straight part. Usually it's the horizon. In this case, I'm doing it through sort of the, the bulk of the trees. And when I let go, it crops. Now that's done it too much. It's taken the trees all the way to the edge. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring out the distortion correction a bit for the back. No, that's not doing it. Sorry. Um, sorry, I'm going to dial it down so it's less correction. Okay, that makes the, street, the trees come in a bit more. And hmm, I think I've gone too far with that. So I'm going to curve it back a little bit. And that'll let me increase the crop size. Ah, Got to make sure I lock that and put it back to the original uh, 4x6. Okay, that's looking a bit better now. I've got more of the Milky Way than I had, and the trees aren't being cropped off too much. They're sort of fitting within the edges of the composition quite well. Wow, time's gone fast. Okay, I'll move through these a bit faster. Um, so I'll do my other corrections now. So detail, luminance reduction, a bit of increased contrast, colors good, turn sharpening off. All right. White balance correction, and this time I'm going to look only at the sky. I want the sky to be neutral. I don't care about the trees. I'm going to deal with them later. So I'm going to increase the blues quite a bit. Now I can see that the pink is too much, so I'll bring that down. Okay, that looks about right, but a bit too yellow. So bring the blues back up again, by the way. Okay, that looks about in the middle. So there's blue down here and yellow up here. So it's about equal, maybe a bit more blue, but I, I kind of like a little bit more blue. And pink versus green, maybe a little bit too green, but it's not too bad. I'm going to leave it, uh, I'll change it a little bit. Um, where's that pink? There we go, that'll do. All right, reset these. Now let's do our contrast work. Okay, that's looking a bit better. Oh, I also need to do the blacks and the whites. Oop. Sorry about blinding you folks when that comes up, but uh, it does preview in white. Okay, I can bring that down quite a long way before it gets too much clipping. Same with the whites. About there. Okay, that's made it a bit too dark, so... Bring up the shadows. There we go. Uh, even the highlights, which is going to be the brighter stars part. Okay, now I'm going to do a little bit of dehaze. That's starting to look pretty good. Black's gone a bit dark thing again though, so I'm going to bring that up. And shadows down a little bit. Contrast up. It's very iterative backwards and forwards. Okay, I'm quite liking the contrast there, so I'm going to work on the colour now. So bring the vibrance up, and that's revealing it's a little bit too blue. So I'm going to go back to the blue here, 
So I'm going to make it a bit warmer. Okay. Oh, not quite that much. About there. All right. Um, and we've got pink coming out in the sides here again. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, I think I will... Hmm. I'm going to do a little bit of the uh, vignetting. Oh, no, that's too much. Okay. I'm going to leave that for now. I'll come back and look at it in a moment. Next, I'm going to deal with the trees. And I'm going to do that with an adjustment brush. This is similar to the gradient filter I showed you a moment ago in that you're applying an area on the photo that's going to have the effects that you um, control applied only to there. However, this time you brush in the effect rather than use a gradient. So I'm just going to, going to change that to slightly bluer and slightly lower exposure just so I can see what I'm doing. And it's sort of going in the right direction for the corrections I want. All right, let's uh, just paint this over. And this tool can cause quite a bit of lag in the editing. So it takes a few seconds to show up or more. Has that worked yet? There it goes. Okay, so that's a bit too much. So I'm going to bring the exposure back up. And what I might do actually, I'm just going to do it in the highlights because the bright parts that are highlights and whites, it's the bright parts that are too bright, not the shadows. So I don't need to decrease the brightness of everything. And I'm going to make it a bit more blue. Actually, no, I'm not. What I'm going to do, you can see that we're getting blue around the edges here where I've painted over the sky as well. What I can do is selectively target just those colors. So out of the adjustment brush and into the colors panel. <clears throat> All right, so um, I'm going to pick the yellows and I'm going to reduce the saturation just of the yellows. And you can see there that already has helped a lot. I'm also going to drop down the luminance a little. That's better. Now you have to be aware that there are yellows in the Milky Way. And so you don't want to affect those too much. Yep. It switched off. Okay, cool. Um, but I like that. I think that's working now. I might just do a little bit of orange desaturation as well. Yeah, those trees are looking a lot more natural now, aren't they? They're looking more green. And actually, I might even help that a bit more. I'm going to go into the green slider and increase that saturation a little bit. Okay, that's much better. Um, I could tweak the edges of this to make them a bit brighter and so on if I wanted to for ages, and I sometimes do. But I'm going to leave that one like that because uh, we're still getting close to time. Um, so this was after processing... And that's before. So you can see that one's quite a dramatic difference. It really has, I believe, helped the photo quite significantly from the original to something that looks, um, well, I won't say more natural because you never see the Milky Way like that with your own eyes, but it looks more pleasing. <clears throat> Have you got any questions before I go on to the next example? <laughs> yes. Quite a lot. Um, I've, I've been doing this for a while now, so I have a fairly good idea of what the Milky Way will look like with post-processing. So I know um, how to shoot in order to give myself the most editing latitude so that I'm not overexposing any of the highlights or underexposing too much of the, the darks. Uh, one of the good things about the night sky is that it's very hard to uh, completely lose the details in the blacks because the night sky is not black. There is always some glow there. Um, the, you can see a good example of that in the first shot I edited where the trees were completely jet black but the sky was visible. Um, so as long as you expose so that you're not overexposing the highlights, then you're going to have enough room to edit that. So I, I bear that in mind when I'm taking the shots and um, making the exposure selections. Um, but also I know that I'll be able to bring out a lot of contrast and saturation that you can't see on the back of the camera. Yes, Braden. Yeah, <laughs> Gradient yep. Is there a similar one but it does it radially? Yes, it there is. Uh, this tool here. So that's a radial filter. I won't show too much in it, but it's yeah, basically it's the cool. same thing yeah. from a center point going out. Okay, cool. All right. 
Now I'm going to skip over the next example that I had. Uh, I can come back to it if we have time or if you'd like to see it, but I'm going to show you um, what you can do when you take it the next step. So if you do have a tracking platform or if you do have a telescope mount, that means you can use longer focal lengths and longer exposures. And you also, because the uh, camera is being guided, it's following the stars, you can take multiple exposures and the stars are going to be in rel relatively the same positions, roughly the same positions. That means you can use a technique called stacking. So I've taken 10 photos here of the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, and a single photo, as you can see, it's a quite low contrast. This is, um, I think, taken under moderate light pollution. So not, not, not dark skies, but not the city. Uh, if we zoom in, and I'll take it to uh, three times, or 300%. I think my computer's starting to complain now because of the editing filling up all of its RAM. So that's one, one, one to one, and this is at three to one. You can just see, it's still loading the preview there, but that is quite mottled background noise there. Um, we want to get rid of that. The main reason being is because this is a low contrast image. The noise is almost as bright as the stars. For example, if you can see here, there's a star there, right? That's almost as bright as the noise. We want to make the noise less significant so that the star stands out. Essentially, we're trying to improve the signal to noise ratio. So what we do is we take multiple exposures, all at the same settings. And in this case, this was taken with the Canon 5D Mark III, where a 135 millimeter lens, uh, which is moderately long. So you can see the, the um, Magellanic Cloud fills the frame or most of the frame. Uh, it was taken at F2, uh, ISO 1600 and two minute exposures. Now I took more than 10 uh, and I put 10 on here only so that I could show you without overloading my computer but when I tried it at home before I came here to make sure that it would work it still killed the computer. So I'm going to have to describe some of these steps rather than show them because I can't do it on this computer. But what we do is we select all our sub exposures or subs as they're called and this is where Photoshop comes in. So with them all selected, we right click on one of them and choose um, Edit In and then select the option Merge to Panorama in Photoshop. Now what we're not doing here is not actually creating a panorama, but the Panorama Merge tool in Photoshop, it looks at the images and it sees where there are common features between those images and it tries to align them. Now usually what you're doing is you're taking a series of photos with a 20% overlap or something like that and it joins those at the 20% margin. But here we've got a 99% overlap. And that's still going to work to align them all together and stack them all on top of each other at the same position. So when you click Merge to Panorama in Photoshop, it will then load all these images into Photoshop. It'll pop up a box giving you some options. The only option you'll change from that is the checkbox to say, um, blend panorama because we don't want to blend them all together into one image We want them all to stay as separate images just on top of each other So you uncheck that box and then load it into Photoshop now, I've got um, Yes, yes question uh, It is going in uh, as DNG files, which is what I convert my camera's native raw format into um, but yes, it's essentially the full 16-bit um, data files, the raw files. Um, it doesn't go through the Adobe raw converter because uh, you're doing a very specific task with that. Uh, it doesn't call that up then because otherwise you'd have to do that for every single one of the photos that you're bringing in and that would just interrupt the workflow too much. Uh, they were converted from CR2s, which is the Canon native format, into DNG inside Lightroom. There's a convert to DNG tool built into Lightroom. Uh, it can happen automatically. You can check a box on import. I prefer to do it manually, but that's just a simple matter of selecting all, going to the library menu, convert to DNG, and it's done. Or after a few minutes, it's done. So, yes. That's all right. Mosaicing and stacking if you lose some spaces. It's very similar. Um, mosaicing you'll often do with a series of stacked photos that you've blended and then you mosaic together. 
because you don't want to lose the ability to stack just because you want a mosaic, which is making essentially a panorama of the sky. Um, so yes, you can do this a similar thing, but you would have to go through the stacking of all of your mosaic subframes first, then take those output files and then put those back into Photoshop but through the same process, but this time checking to align and have them blend together. Yes. Correct. That's right. So that's when you really need to have good file management because you're getting lots of different files and lots of different names. Yes, Anthony. So we should do it in the panel and then you just start the stack. Is it also rotating the images at the same time? So it will do whatever it takes to get them to align as best as possible. It will shift up and down, it will rotate and it will tilt. Uh, it can even distort because your position may have moved forward and backward when you're taking a, a, a handheld panorama, so it tries to compensate for that. If you're doing tracking, though, it needs to do far less than that because the, the tracking platform, if it's well aligned, doesn't have any of those sorts of issues because you can't really tilt. You won't tilt relative to the sky, for example. Yeah. Yes, Braden. Which one becomes the template in that case? Uh, good question. Um, which one distorts to which unit? I think they all go to an average, yeah. and then you get some stuff around the edge that you may need to crop out. Um, I don't know how Photoshop chooses. If you're using more advanced software like PixInsight, you do tell it the reference image, um, but in this case, Photoshop takes care of that. All right, so once we've got it into Photoshop, we've now got an image with multiple layers, however many you took in your um, sequence. Uh, this is the kind of software or the kind of process that really does require a powerful computer. So you may be limited to the number of um, subs you can have in your stack. Otherwise, I mean, you've got, you know, 10, 20, 30 raw photos, all of which are 30, 40 megabytes in size, all sitting in RAM because Photoshop is working on every pixel on of every photo. So you'll need a lot of RAM and you'll need a fairly beefy computer to get through it quickly. Um, other software can do this more efficiently, things like Deep Sky Stacker, which is free, but I'll talk about that uh, another time. Um, but Photoshop will work quite well on a beefy machine with a number of, say, 20 or less sub-exposures. So I've just got two in here as an example. What we do is we select both of those in the layer palette over here. Then we choose from the uh, layer palette options, um, convert to smart object. What that does is it's... Well, I don't know exactly what it does, but it combines them all together in such a way that they appear as one layer and allows you to do other processes on that. Now, I'm not going to do that with these because these are out, uh, output images. So I will show you instead a screen capture of what you do next. So here we've got a screenshot of um, Photoshop. We've got our 10 layers over here converted into a smart object, which is indicated by this little icon down the bottom corner. Then we go up into the layer menu, we choose smart objects, stack mode, and then median. And what that does is it goes through each of the images in the smart object, looks at each pixel coordinate, so say one by one, looks at all 10 pixels or however many stacks you've got, and it picks a median value for that. And then goes to the next pixel, picks the median value for that, and so on for all the many megapixels in all of your images. And if you know anything about maths, median stacking essentially picks the most frequent value and uses that as to be the value for the new output image. And that has the effect of reducing the noise because the noise is random between pixels. So the result we get, if we go back into Photoshop, what I've got here is two JPEG images because it wouldn't handle the, uh, the, the raw um, files. Um, underneath, I've got a single sub exposure of the original photo, so you can see the noise there. And on top, I've layered an output image of the 10 photos stacked together. And if I turn that on... Okay, oh, there we go. So you can see there, the noise is much reduced. I'll turn it off again, and on again. Now, that may look really subtle, but if we go in and look at, say, look at this star here. Do you see where I'm pointing there? There's a very faint star there. If I turn the uh, stacked version off, it's a lot harder to see, and stars nearby it 
there's a lot more stars that pop out around it that you couldn't see before at all. They're lost in the noise. It also means that we now have a lower noise floor so that we can increase the exposure without increasing the noise. So, once that's done, you have a single file or a single image. You then go into the layer palette again and you go um, flatten image. That takes your smart object, which, which contains all the layers, and then um, comp compresses those layers all down into one. So you've got an image with a single layer as a result, and you save that. And one of the good things about working with Adobe software is that the applications all work together. That will now automatically be round trip re-imported back into Lightroom, and then you can continue your, edit your editing from there. So we'll go back into Lightroom, and this is the output, which I'll load into the develop module. <coughs> Here's what I prepared earlier. So already you can see um, it's looking like it's got a nice and dynamic range. And if I zoom right in, you can still see noise there, but it's significantly better than it was. Uh, the reason why the noise is a little bit more obvious there than it was in the preview I just showed you is that this has already got a bit more contrast. I think I might have tweaked this one a little bit when I brought it in already. But we then continue our post-processing from the same spot as we did before. And actually, one thing I did forget to mention, and uh, I should have done so first, is when we uh, before we do the merging and into Photoshop, we need to do the basic corrections that we did on the previous images first. So we need to do the um, lens corrections, so um, flattening it and getting rid of the vignetting. Uh, we need to do our um, white balance correction, so getting the white balance as neutral as possible. We don't do any noise correction because we want that noise to be in its original form so that can be filtered out by the software. Um, and then you do it into the uh, into Photoshop. Then you do the smart object medium blend in Photoshop and you do your round trip back into here and you continue processing after the point where we've done our initial um, correction. So I'm just going to do a quick process of this without talking too much or with just describing a little bit of what I'm doing. Um, I've already cropped this a little bit too just because I wanted to bring the LMC more to the center. All right, so I can see here, I need to bring the blacks right down because the histogram is showing there's nothing in the blacks. So I'll bring that down there. Looks like we're already high on the white. So if I hold that and have a look, yep, we've only got a few stars clipped. That's good. Um, by doing that, bring the blacks right down and having the contrast there, we've got a bit of vignetting starting to reappear. So perhaps we didn't correct it as well as we could have, but I can do that in post a little bit later or in, in Photoshop. So I'm just bringing in the contrast, looking at the, the galaxy here. I'm liking that. Uh, now we can, we've already done the um, noise reduction with the stacking, but we can still do that noise reduction again in Lightroom with what's left. So I'm going to do this now. So sharpening's already off. Bring up some noise reduction there. Bring some contrast back to help the details a little bit and color. So we're, we're doing noise filtering on top of noise filtering. And that's making a huge improvement compared to what we could have done if we just did it in a single exposure. All right, I think that's a little blue. So I'm gonna make, warm it up a little bit. Oh, too much. All right, let's uh, do it with the keyboard. Yeah, that's a bit better. Let's bring out the vibrance, see how it looks. Okay, we've got a bit of green coming in there. So bring in some pink. Yeah, a bit better, but I think I will make the blue go away a little bit more. Oh, it's a tricky one there. All right, uh, let's do some dehaze because it's looking a little bit hazy. Oh, too much. Okay, and we've definitely got a strong gradient here um, from the bottom to the top. Uh, I think that may be um, light pollution. So I'm dragging it from the bottom up. Oop, looks like I'd also put on some color correction on that one. So, hey, it looks kind of nice, but that's not what I want it to look like. So I'll double click temperature to get rid of that. Uh, I won't make the exposure come down quite that much. 
And I'm going to reduce the exposure in the shadows specifically because it's the sky that's got the gradient in. So I want to leave whatever's in the milk in, in the, the galaxy here and reduce the shadows. Um, maybe it's a bit too much. All right, that's a bit better, I think. Let's have a look at before and after. Definitely an improvement. I would fine tune that a little bit more to get it a bit, get it as balanced and even as possible. But uh, for the sake of the demonstration, I'll keep it keep it going. Just dropping the shadows down a bit more to try and clean up the background a little bit. Might bring the blacks back up again. Oh no, too far. All right. I think that's as good as I'm going to get it without um, fussing over it all night. But if I compare that with the with a single um, raw sub exposure, you can see it's quite a drastic difference. So that's the power of um, stacking your photos. You can really push things a lot further than you would have been able to on a single sub because the noise floor is reduced so significantly. Your signal is stronger, so you can work with your signal without having to worry about the noise so much. All right, so do we have any questions on the uh, post-processing workflow? No, okay, great. Yeah, one, <laughs> one important question before you start post-processing, um, the monitor that we use, whether it's a laptop or a PC with a monitor, actually graduating that monitor first is probably important. Uh, calibrating it? Yeah. Yes, if you can. Um, <laughs> color calibration is, uh, or color consistency is one of the biggest thorns in the sides of photographers. <clears throat> uh, when we're taking and editing our photos, we um, go to great care to try and make sure the color looks exactly right. We want to have exactly the right tint, exactly the right warmth to it. Uh, and so we spend a while making it look good on our monitors and then we um, upload it to Facebook and look at our phone. We go, hang on, that looks nothing like what I just did. And you look at on your friend's computer screen, it looks different again. The problem is that every computer screen displays colors slightly differently and the same screen can display it differently as the screen ages and your brain can interpret colors differently depending on the surrounding environment light. Mm. So it's essentially like chasing your tail. You're never going to get exactly the right color constancy across all platforms and all media. So you try and do the best you can. Having a calibrated screen or using a tool to calibrate your screen regularly will help, but there's a limit to um, what that can do and it's not going to help you um, have your photo look good on anyone else's screen because they're not going to necessarily be calibrating your screen. Yeah. Um, so if you can calibrate your screen before processing, you're eliminating one variable, that is your own screen, and at least you know that when you're looking at your work, it looks like you expect it to. Yes. One, uh, yeah. Sorry, yes. going to print, or do you get that done by someone else? Oh, sorry, what was the first part? You, you have the same problem with colour when you go to uh, an actual... Print. You certainly can do, yes. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the, uh, there's a number of things you can do to improve your chances of getting it correct. Firstly, <coughs> shoot in a broad color, um, broad color gamut. Uh, many cameras have the ability to shoot in Adobe Camera Raw color space as opposed to sRGB color space. If you have that option available on your camera, turn it on. It just gives you a few more colors. Um, you may not necessarily see those on your monitor, but most professional photo labs have the dynamic range in their printers to print that full gamut. Um, Secondly, choose a good print lab. Um, go to someone that you can trust to pr produce high quality prints with a good dynamic range and their, their equipment is good. Uh, and third, ask for proofs. Uh, it'll cost you a bit more, but you can um, take in your computer if you've got it on a laptop or you can you know, know what you want it to look like. Ha have a look on their screen and then ask them to print out a small copy on the same stock with the same equipment and see if that looks like you want it to. And if you say, okay, well, looking at this, this looks a bit too pink, dial a bit more green into the screen so that you know that when the proof comes, when the print comes out, it looks more like you want it to on screen because the, the proof is what you want it to look like because that's the same material that it's going to be going on the <coughs> final print. Yes, you had a question. So, how much RAM is a decent RAM? Good question. <laughs> I would say no less than eight right. uh, because the operating system itself requires a couple of, uh, a couple of gigs of RAM. 
Um, you want to try and minimize any of the apps that you're running as possible, like don't have your browser open. Uh, because we're using both Lightroom and Photoshop here, they're both RAM-hungry programs, and so running both at the same time is going to chew up your RAM. So as soon as you're finished with Photoshop, close it. Um, but I would recommend at least 16 gig as a good, um, comfortable uh, amount of RAM for editing large stacks of images. Uh, I have 32 gig on my machine, but as a professional photographer, I can justify the extra expense of doing that. Um, when I was stacking 10 uh, images, these 10 images on my desktop, uh, the whole process of um, aligning the panorama, um, to converting it to a smart object, and then doing the median stacking, that would take around about five minutes. On my laptop, uh, it took about half an hour to three quarters of an hour just for the first step. So um, CPU and RAM are both really important. The more you have, the better. Uh, if you have no concern or not too much concern about your budget, I would go for the best model and then down a couple because you're going to be paying significantly less for not being at the very top, but you're going to be getting very close to performance. Um, but I would say if you have the option, 16 gig of RAM is probably a good amount to have to edit with. Yep. The second question, if I can push my mind. Of course, no. About spending lots of money. The Maxim DL program, we spend about $500 for that. Is yep. that worth it? It sounds like you're doing most of it just on this. Um, I couldn't really say because I've never used Maxim DL. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know what its capabilities are. Uh, is there anyone in the room that's used Maxim DL that can answer that? Yes? Yeah, it's specifically designed to process what they call fits format, yep. which is entirely different from Photoshop. You might. You can actually do a copy of an image in Maxim once you've done whatever treatments you need and then uh, paste them straight into a Photoshop. Or you can use a one called Fitz Liberator that, that is, is a plug-in for, Fitz, for a Photoshop. Is it much better than just doing this? It's different. It it's it's different. A, Fitz, Fitz is a different format altogether. It's, it's like similar to the RAW but it's got a little bit more information than even raw has, you know, so, so you can actually annotate and do all sorts of things. It's um. It's a fancy high level. It, it is. It's sort of more <laughs> research scientific grade files because it comes with a whole bunch of metadata, which can then be used in the processing process. There, I did. I knew I was going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's another piece of software which I use called um, PixInsight, and that is, I believe, a lot like Max and DL. It's designed specifically for processing night sky photos, uh, and particularly for telescopic. Um, night sky photos with an astro camera. Uh, I may talk about that in a future lecture. I'm actually photos. Um, if you get Max and DL or Pix Insight, they're really only very good for night sky photos and the like, or very specialist photography. Um, Lightroom, you can process any of your family photos, holiday photos, whatever. Uh, and it's, it's very good photo management as well. Uh, the, the library and the catalogue system is um, good for managing large volumes of photos, whereas um, Pix Insight is just processing one or two at a time. Thank you. Great. Very quick question. I know you didn't go into it, but mm -hmm. Registax or Deep Sky Stacking? Which one? Um, Registax is designed more for um, stacking of planetary work. So uh, high frame rates, short exposure times. Yeah. Uh, it's good at stacking small dimension images with many hundreds or thousands of frames. Deep Sky Stacker is more designed for deep sky stuff, as the name suggests. Yes. Uh, it will allow you to use calibration frames. Uh, it's good at high resolution images with smaller number of sub exposures. When I say smaller, I'm talking 30 to 50 as opposed to 5,000. Uh, you wouldn't want to do a, a stack of 5,000 in Deep Sky Stacker because you'd be there for weeks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yes? From a totally new person to photography, does that uh, rule of pick the absolute best and knock it back twice? have the same effect with camera equipment as it does with computers? Pretty much. I think it applies to most technology, in fact. Um, mobile phones and so forth, if you're on the bleeding edge, you're going to be paying for it, and you're only going to be getting a few percent um, better performance, unless, of course, there's a particular brand new feature that you just have to have. <laughs> so, generally, in, in my advice for technology would be to get uh, find the best model and then go down one or two. Uh, and also, a golden rule I use is don't buy uh, or don't upgrade until you have to, but when you do have to, spend as much as you can afford because then it'll last longer. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, would you be using calibration frames with camera and uh, You can. More for 
For Absolutely. landscape night photography, I wouldn't bother because there are always going to be single frames. Uh, if you're going to be doing stacking like this, then you could benefit from um, using uh, calibration frames like ducks, um, biases, or maybe not so much bias because you're not, you're not really getting into that problem so much. Uh, but definitely darks can help and definitely flats can help because you don't get the vignetting there. Flats can correct for vignetting uh, much the same way that the profiles do, but it does a better job because it takes into account variations in your particular camera gear. Uh, your specific camera, like if you've got dust on your lens or your sensor and so forth. Uh, I don't ever personally use calibration frames when I'm doing DSLR photography, but that's mostly because now I've got my telescope and astro camera if I'm going to be doing multiple frames, I'll be doing it with the Astro camera. If I'm using my SLR, it's going to be for single frame wide field stuff. You had a question? Yeah. Um, it's more of, more of a CCD cooling question more than DSLR, but yep. um, I know you've got experience with DSLRs and also um, specific astronomic cameras. Yep. Um, how much difference does it make between cooling the camera and just having it, the camera uncooked? Quite in terms a bit. Of noise, noise reduction. Yeah, quite significant. I can't give you numbers, but subjectively I can tell you that it's roughly the equivalent difference you saw between the single frame and the 10 frame stack. Seriously? Yes. Wow. Um, if you can get your camera, if the ambient camera temperature is say 40 degrees, which is not un uncommon for the sensor of the camera, uh, you can get that cooled down to say minus 10, minus 20 degrees. That is going to be a very significant difference in the amount of noise that you'll see. Um, the camera I use, the ASI 1600, that advertises um, minus 45 degrees from the ambient. And when it says that, it's talking about the air temperature that the camera is in, not the sensor temperature. So the sensor temperature is usually 20 degrees above the ambient. So it's doing really significant cooling, yeah. which can have a dramatic effect on the amount of noise that you see. And I do notice that when I'm taking photos, particularly if it's on a warm night. If I forget to turn on the cooler on a warm night, I will know when I see the first photo come in because the noise is so much worse. Oh. Yep. Yeah, are you talking about dark frames before? If you yes. were using the DSL rather than your CCD camera, yes. would you consider taking the camera darks rather yes. than taking Yes. Yeah, frames? that's a, a great suggestion. Um, many DSLRs have a feature built in called long exposure noise reduction or something, a variation mm -hmm. of that. Um, it, it's often turned on by default and you may have discovered that in your frustration when you take a, a 30 second photo and then the camera takes forever to save. It'll say busy or processing or whatever. Yeah. What it's doing there is it's taking a second 30 second exposure but with the mirror down and the shutter closed. What it does then is it looks at any pixels that have still got data on them when there's no data hitting them. That means it's measuring the base level activation of every sensor. And the reason why that's important is because every camera sensor that's manufactured, there's minute variations in each photo site, each pixel on the sensor. Some of them record um, more ambient noise, the heat of the sensor, any background stuff, more than other pixels. They're called hot pixels. And in-camera noise reduction or dark frame subtraction works by taking two photos it then subtracts the second dark frame from the original light frame automatically and then saves the calibrated file as your image. So I usually turn that off because in 30 second exposures you're not usually getting enough of that hot pixel noise that it stands out above and beyond any of the noise that I'm filtering out otherwise. However, if I'm doing say for example a 15 or 20 minute uh, or even longer star trail photo <coughs> then those hot pixels become far more obvious in the resulting photo than the random noise from the sensor itself or from the, the variations in the, um, the various things that cause noise. The hot pixels become far more uh, of an issue. So I will often turn on the in-camera noise reduction in that case. Uh, you might want to experiment with leaving it on and turning it off and seeing the results it has on the noise in the photos that you've taken. Again, it might be something that's more of an issue on hot nights. You might want to turn it on on nights where it's over 10, 15 degrees Celsius at night because it may be affecting the, the <coughs> older as well. Older cameras especially, yes. If you've got anything from the early generations like 10 to 5 years old, I would definitely recommend testing your long exposure noise reduction and seeing how much of a difference that can make. Anyone else? Yes? Windows or Apple make any difference? Not at all. 
No. Um, you might be limited in the choice of software that you have available. Uh, I don't know if Deep Sky Stacker or um, Registacks are available on um, Macintosh. Yeah, they run fine via Wine. Fantastic. So yeah, you've got options with Macintosh if you can run Wine or other um, Windows emulation. Or there might be um, Macintosh native software available that's either the same or an alternative. Uh, it's not going to have any impact whatsoever on your ability to capture photos or process them. It's just a matter of how. Yep, yeah, go for it. Um, uh, in this talk, you predominantly talked about Lightroom and just used Photoshop to stack the image yep. and send it straight back to you. Do you actually use Photoshop for any of the processing that's going to be live? It does. Uh, uh, I... You also talked about Fix Insight, so I'm just wondering if yep. you use Photoshop or Fix Insight. I'm a big fan of Lightroom because I'm very familiar with it and I like the way it handles things. Uh, I do use Lightroom for photo manipulation anywhere where I need to do any edits of specific areas like, um, for example, joining a foreground and a background, the, the sky and, and the foreground image, or if I want to edit out a power pole or um, anything that I don't want to have in the photo I want to remove, for example. Uh, I tend to find the tools in Lightroom do uh, do what I, I ask them to better than Photoshop because I'm more familiar with them. But there are tools in Photoshop that a lot of astrophotographers use that I don't. So I, I may be missing out on some features. Um, there are a number of like actions that you can use to reduce noise and to correct for some issues that I haven't used before. Yes, there are some gradient removal things as well. Um, Pix Insight, however, in my experience, is the king of gradient removal. It's got a, an amazing tool in there which alone for me was worth the $350 Australian purchase price. Um, but I'll get into that in part four of my series. Anyone else? No, it looks like we're all good then. Okay. Well, I hope you've uh, enjoyed uh, watching this tonight and uh, following up from my last uh, lecture about uh, shooting astrophotography, I hope that you can now take the photos that you've taken since then and give them, a bit of, give them a bit of spit and polish to make them look as good as you can possibly get them uh, and up your game and uh, impress your family and friends on Facebook. What's <laughs> <Watch> that? <it out. laughs>